Hello, welcome to Baltic World. My name is Crispin. Europe is now catapulted into a post-Merkel age. Since Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Angela Merkel has been left defending her record, not altogether convincingly, uh, but without a doubt, she was the de facto leader of the continent for many years. Now, there is a new political leader who has emerged as the moral authority, I think probably the political authority, that is going to dominate the continent for years to come. And that is the Prime Minister of Estonia, Kaya Kallas. She has proven herself Churchillian. And I use that term reluctantly because I know it's often hyperbolic. But in fact, Kaya Kallas has expressed a great sense of political acumen and moral authority when it comes to standing up to Vladimir Putin. She has been the rock that has glued the rest of Europe together and the United States for that matter in terms of staying the course and not compromising on the overwhelming military and strategic objective of driving Russia out of Ukraine. So when the Russians invaded initially. It was a global shock. Everyone reacted. Everyone got on the same page. It was a great moment of European unity and Western unity. However, this conflict is evolving in terms of its new cycle. It's no longer an overwhelming invasion against hapless defenders defending their major capital cities. The war has now shifted to a grueling conflict of attrition focused primarily in the east of the country. Meanwhile, the sanctions that had been imposed on Russia is beginning to hurt the Europeans themselves. And that is fragmenting the unity that had previously existed. Uh, for example, Emmanuel Macron has essentially called for Ukraine to start making compromises uh, with Russia in order to achieve peace. Meanwhile, Kaya Kallas, the Prime Minister of Estonia, the most admirable political figure in the world today, in my opinion, has stayed the course. And in fact, she has given remarkable speeches. The other day, uh, she accepted the Grotius Prize in the UK. She delivered a fantastic address in which she outlined what I would consider to be a doctrine when it comes to maintaining the global international balance. And it rests on five principles, which I'm paraphrasing, uh, but I would like to go through in detail because I think it brings everybody on the same page. The first principle of what I'm calling the callous doctrine is that a bad peace is worse than a just war. And that is difficult for many people, particularly in the West, to internalize. Because the Second World War, the First World War, we look at that in terms of the worst depravities of the human experience. Terrible atrocities, horrible carnage, anything must be better than that. Now, juxtapose that with our post-war experience. Huge material boom, great peace dividend, the baby boomer generation experiencing extraordinary wealth accumulation uh, that is continuing to this day. Meanwhile, those in Eastern Europe could not have had a more different experience. They experienced the uh, invasion occupation of the German war machine only to be uh, repressed under Soviet domination for five decades in which all their individual rights are stripped away, their countries plundered, uh, their people having no rights whatsoever. And so, yes, it was peace. There was no war, but that was no way to live. And in my day-to-day -day interactions with various uh, international theorists, political scholars, uh, if I advise something that is potentially risky, potentially aggressive, it's usually because there is a cost to the status quo. So, for example, if we talk about North Korea's nuclear weapons program, people are like, well, we don't want to do anything that's too threatening to North Korea that forces them to potentially give up their nuclear weapons because it could lead to some kind of crisis, some kind of active aggression. And to which the reply would be, yes, but there is a consequence of doing nothing. And we have to weigh that in. You know, if we have five, 10 years from now in which North Korea's nuclear arsenal is you know, 50 nuclear weapons, 100 nuclear weapons, 
then what would stop them from being aggressive? If they wanted to attack Japan, if they wanted to invade South Korea, how would we in the West respond? And it's very difficult to get answers to these questions, i.e. that advising on a course of action that would resist aggression might lead to conflict is often considered a justification in itself. And what Kayak Hallis is saying is no, sometimes wars are necessary. If you are defending yourself, if you're defending what's right, those wars are worth fighting because if you don't stand up to aggression, if you don't uh, push back against uh, autocratic regimes, then what you're setting is a bad peace in which you're constantly giving up everything, every time, such that you are undermining your own sovereignty and freedom of action. So Kaya Kallis is saying that a bad peace is worse than a just war. Number two of the Kallis doctrine is directly related to this, and that is a failure to throw Russia out of Ukraine completely, to give them nothing, will invite aggression everywhere. For example, if Russia invades Ukraine captures Donbass, pushes the Ukrainians westward, manages to create a land bridge to uh, Transnistria, gets all these strategic advantages and concessions, manages to trade away sanctions while still gaining territory, then that's going to prove that aggression is successful and other autocratic governments, other expansionist powers will take those lessons. So for example, China has long sought to reincorporate Taiwan into the mainland, is willing to do so by force if it thinks that it can get away with it, if it's proven to be successful, if the taboo has been broken against invading other places, then China will certainly do this and it will lead to much greater conflict. And we have seen this time and time again. If Adolf Hitler truly believed that the British and the French would go to war for Poland, he wouldn't have invaded in the first place. But he didn't believe that because there'd been compromises in Czechoslovakia, in Austria, uh, under the Munich Conventions. He had no reason to believe uh, the Western powers or to take their threats seriously. So if Russia gains in Ukraine, then other autocratic regimes around the world will take the same lessons. The third pillar of the Kallus Doctrine is that we cannot be afraid of humiliating our enemies by defeating them. And this is throwing sand directly in the eyes of Emmanuel Macron, who is saying, no, 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 we don't want to humiliate Russia. We want to give them an off-ramp, make some concessions so they don't have an incentive to escalate. But the problem is that Russia's war of aggression is not motivated just by threat perception. If it was purely out of fear, Macron's argument might hold water. For example, it's true that Russia has experienced three major invasions through its uh, northern bridge, right? So Sweden invaded, Napoleon invaded, uh, the German war machine invaded, and Russia suffered immensely as a result. And Russia has said that the expansion of NATO is the greatest threat to Russia, and it was willing to go to war to prevent that. The problem is that's not the real motivation. It's not fear, it's greed. If you listen to Vladimir Putin's lengthy speech before invading, which was pre-recorded, all pre-planned, he goes into the restoration of the Russian Empire. He doesn't respect the fact that Ukraine is a sovereign country. He thinks that Russia has suzerainty over all uh, Slavs, all Orthodox uh, adherents, and that uh, the Baltic region, Poland, uh, Ukraine, the Greece even, is essentially part of greater Russia, and that the restoration of the Russian Empire will be his personal legacy. And this great outsized ambition of this universalist Russian empire is something that the Russian government, the Russian people need to be broken off. It's never going to happen, but the attempt to realize that goal is going to cause immense human suffering, not least to the Russian people themselves, for a dream that is simply a delusion, a historical and not justified either by Russia's power, but or even by the realities of Slavic identity and life. Like it just 
isn't a real dream. And so the only way to convince Russia to abandon that delusion and to reintegrate itself as a normal country in the European community of nations is to be utterly defeated on the battlefield. So the real uh, way of avoiding humiliation, and I do uh, personally believe that you should be magnanimous in victory, you should not do everything in your power to injure a, a country that was previously an adversary because they can become your friend. If we look at Japan after the Second World War, America treated them very generously, helped with the reconstruction. They became a firm bulwark against communism. Conversely, Germany after the First World War, uh, the French treated them appallingly, and that led to great resentment, uh, certainly contributing to the rise of National Socialism and the subsequent invasion of France. So we should look at ways of co-opting uh, Russia in the future once they have been utterly defeated. So once they are vulnerable, once they're weak, once they're at the mercy of the Western powers to say to Russia, look, we're not going to inflict every injury that's within our power. We're not going to even do to you what you did to us. Uh, but you do need to make some changes, including cultural changes that ceases this ambition of reshaping the map of Europe and instead being part of Europe. And that, I think, is Callus's point, that you should not reward aggressors while they're aggressing. Uh, they have to take accountability for their crimes. And once the proper restitution has been made, then you act towards them with generosity and kindness. I think that is a very sound approach and with great moral clarity. The fourth pillar of the Callous Doctrine is perhaps the most challenging for democratic leaders and various groups in civil society, and that is we must not succumb to fatigue. When the invasion occurred, it dominated global headlines. But if you look at Google Analytics now, search for Ukraine, uh, the war, has diminished almost to pre-conflict levels. And then as new important issues emerge, there are competing uh, interests for political attention. And also, as the cost of the war in terms of inflation, uh, cost of living, the export of wheat, gas, other issues, impact upon various societies around the world, well, political peers are going to be responsive to the demands of the people, particularly when it becomes a political imperative, and thus might call for compromises when previously they would have been strong and resolute. And uh, one thing that can be said for the Estonian people is that they have paid a higher price than anybody else to maintain the conflict, to contribute to Ukraine and its defense. Uh, and Kaya Kallas being the leader of such an extraordinary resolute people, I think is a shining light to the rest of the world. In other words, it's it would be far less impressive if it was a hypocritical doctrine that Callas was espousing here, i.e. Uh, she was living in Portugal or Brazil and saying, well, yes, the Europeans have to pay a high price to defend Ukraine and maintain the international order. But in fact, she is the leader of the country that is doing more than any other, along with Latvia and Lithuania, to hold the line and hold Russia to account. And so her uh, moral authority to the rest of the country saying, look, I know there are many competing interests. I know your people will get angry and fed up, uh, but we must continue to supply arms, equipment, money to Ukraine. We must increase sanctions and pressure on the Russian government. Uh, and we must do this for the long haul, for however long it takes and however high the cost may be, because the cost of not doing so is that much greater. And the final pillar of the Callous Doctrine is one that I can quote verbatim, uh, and that is, the cost of gas might be high, but the cost of freedom is priceless. And again, Estonia is paying the highest price. Inflation in Estonia is the highest in Europe. It's running at 20%. That's on top of all the refugees that uh, Estonian homes are welcoming them in, the direct financial contributions that are being made. You'll see that same in Latvia and Lithuania. Lithuania, which contributed through crowdfunding, advanced military drones and equipment. Uh, this is a huge burden that is being borne by the people of the Baltic region. Uh, not least of which, of course, is Estonia. And yet 
we have, we've seen quibbles in Germany and France and other places about whether or not the people can afford to pay the gas prices or people are willing to uh, pay more for wheat because uh, the Ukrainian ports are being blockaded from the wheat exports. Things like this, yes, they are a terrible burden for the international community and we shouldn't diminish them. I mean, I know it's it's a bit easy to say, well, look at what the Ukrainians are suffering and that's absolutely fair to point that out. Uh, but it is difficult for political leaders to resist pressure from their own constituents that are struggling with the cost of living, unable to necessarily put food on the table or to heat their homes, and to say, look, you know, is this war really worth this? Well, what Kaya Kallis is pointing out, and I think absolutely correctly, is that it's easy to look at the immediate cost when you haven't experienced the sovereignty cost. So right now your neighbor's house is on fire, but that fire can easily spread if you're pouring down accelerant to spread to your house. And so it's important for political leaders, even if they're experiencing uh, cost and pressure from their constituents to, to actually sell the case for why it is necessary to continue to fight for as long as, as it might need be. Now, one of the things that prolongs war as well is if a country believes that its adversaries are fluctuating in their resolve. For example, in the Second World War, the Germans continued to fight on the Western Front, even though it was completely hopeless, for many months right up to the west of Berlin, and that's because the German leadership deluded itself into thinking that the Western morale was low, that it was looking for an exit, that it didn't want to pay the high price of the bloody conflict, and would be willing to cut a deal, especially if it meant preventing the Soviet Union from gaining absolute power in Eastern Europe. In other words, if you believe that your adversary doesn't have the will to continue the fight, you're much more likely to invest in continuing the fight yourself. And so continued universal messaging, standing up to Vladimir Putin saying, no matter how long you continue this, no matter how much pressure you think you can continue to apply, we are never going to yield on Ukraine's sovereignty. And if he gets that message, then he is far more likely to stop the conflict and return to Russia. Uh, if he thinks he's on the brink of a victory, not necessarily a breakthrough in the actual front lines, but a victory politically, the fragmentation of unity in European countries, uh, then he will continue the fight. The problem he has is Prime Minister Kaya Kallis, who has emerged as this great Churchill figure of the 21st century. I think that history is going to remember her leadership in this time with great sympathy. She seems to be expressing herself without huge amounts of ego, uh, but certain moral clarity and determination. And the rest of the world, I think, is following. Her star has risen in international affairs, particularly when it relates to this conflict and making sure that we don't lose sight of the ultimate objective here. And I absolutely commend her for her efforts in this regard. Now, just in recent days, Kaya Kallis' government has collapsed domestically. She has booted out her major coalition partner. She needs to cobble together an alliance of other political parties or face a no-confidence vote. That could lead to fresh elections. Now, Kaya Kallis' popularity has exploded in the wake of the Ukrainian crisis and her leadership. A cynic might say she's done this deliberately to capitalize on her new political capital and perhaps get a lot more seats in parliament. Uh, I would love to hear your point of view on this. If you're from Estonia, if you're following domestic politics at home, leave your comments down below because I would love to read them and perhaps do a video on in the future. If you want to support our work as well, you can do through through Contrabe. Contrabe is a Lithuanian startup, a Patreon alternative. We do uh, exclusive content for the Contrabe members, a lot of little crazy clips here and there, uh, and that helps the channel go keep going and also Lithuanian business as well. Uh, really appreciate your support. Otherwise, hit the like button, subscribe, share these videos. It helps grow the channel a ton, and I will see you next time. Goodbye.